before we get started here, I wanted to mention a couple of things, which uh, I think this is mostly for Fernando because I think both Alan and <coughs> I have heard this before, but um, uh, you can, uh, I'm gonna put a couple of links in the chat here in a minute. We have uh, a couple of opportunities to stay in touch uh, and to help out with the conference. One of them is a guest book if you want to uh, add your name to that, your email to that, you can um, be on our mailing list for future events uh, from the SSSP's uh, Transnational Initiatives Committee. And also we have a place to do feedback and uh, that link will be in the chat in a minute too. And that is uh, anonymous. Um, the link just takes you straight to the survey and you can fill it out. You can actually fill it out more than once if you want to. And that information is helpful uh, to future committees to be able to uh, consider feedback. It's totally anonymous and won't be shared or used any other place than just for the committee's work. Um, and I will have both of those in the in the uh, um, in the chat in a couple of minutes here while we get started. And then the last thing is that the discussion that we're having here today, we can continue that discussion on the page for the web page for this session. And so be sure to visit that web page. I'll put the link to that in the in the chat as well. And that way, if we get into something really good and can't finish it before we need to move to the next session, we can continue the chat online with each other. So with that, I'll turn it over to Alan. Yeah, the session was conceived because really in, uh... In the last 50 years, especially the last 20, there's been more of a, uh, an understanding of the dialectic between uh, race and class, specifically, uh, because in the past, they tended to either, um, a lot of social scientists tended to either dismiss class and take a class reductionist view, um, I'm sorry, dismiss race and take a class reductionist view that uh, all that really mattered was income and class. And then uh, counterposing that was another view, which I think is one-sided, which uh, basically mystified race, ethnicity into uh, like identity politics. And then the third position emerged, which I think um, does not solve the problem. And that's what's, what's called uh, intersectionality, where they say, okay, it's a mixture of the two. And I think that the idea that it's a mixture of the two still doesn't capture the dialectic the way that, that, that they uh, affect each other, the way that they penetrate each other, the way that they shape, shape and define each other. So in that sense, um, the session was conceived of to get an understanding of the uh, importance of uh, particularly understanding how the dynamic of uh, race, and when I say class, I'm including imperialism in a broader sense, the economic processes, how they uh, interact. So the session was set up for that reason, to, to uh, kind of make sure or emphasize the, uh, the role of ethnicity and, and race and variations on that, because uh, the processes that began with the racist exploitation of labor under early capitalism, actually pre cap well, the, 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 I guess the embryo of capitalism is, I guess is what I would call it, um, has since been replicated. Those processes are replicated, not along strictly racial lines, but it's fundamentally the same process, whether it's Muslims being mistreated in uh, Myanmar, India, or um, Arabs being mistreated in uh, Palestine, we could go on and on with a hundred examples, uh, ethnic groups being discriminated against in the Amazon or in um, Southern Mexico. Um, there's a million examples. And what's key to understand is that 
uh, we don't want to take an essentialist view on uh, sort of a neo vivarian view that says that there's just something in the minds of some people that makes them behave certain ways, um, which doesn't, you don't want to take a class reductionist view that denies the role of consciousness, but there's no reason why we have to make that false choice. So that's what this was conceived of as to have uh, those who are doing more research into this area, um, make sure that this gets brought into the discussion, not in a uh, condescending way or in a missionary way, but in a way that really understands the dynamic between how a class exploitation utilizes race and ethnic um, categories, because that's all they are, categories, uh, to, uh, to sustain the system. I just a bit about the, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, about class reductionism and I I say I think it's more of a as both combining both both work together and both go together and the my research questions were um, how does technology techno technological innovation impact racial inequality under capitalism and well, for example, the introduction of automation will reduce the number of low-skilled workers. This means that if there is <clears throat> if there's this proportional representation of workers of color in this category, then this will lead to greater racial inequality as technology advances. Uh, introducing new technologies to the economy leads to discrimination against race and other forms, how will this impact African-American, Latino, and other workers of color in particular? So this is a, a work in process. So, uh, so I looked at what is the relation between the presence of immigrants and automation? Does having less immigrants increase automation and uh, the result is that greater migration could diminish incentives for replacing workers like technology. But of course, this is because uh, because of low wages, so they're getting paid less. So they don't. So so uh, the technology is more expensive than than paying the low wages to immigrants. Jump in. But you're on mute, or you're just saying hello. <laughs> no, I, I, um, sorry, I kind of like I was, I was all over the place looking up, um, the, the, the introduction, and everything. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think you know, technology and immigrants are, uh, are a very interesting topic. Um, uh, you know, it's the, the, the findings are interesting because. I think one of the things that I found in the US, I mean, in, in China, I, I, always, I guess it's because we talked about China yesterday a lot, you know, um, Alan talked about China a little bit, um, but it was like 20 years ago, labor was so cheap. And so, so, you know, you just pick up the phone, you talk to people, you know, like they answer your questions, they know their business and everything. Uh, but in the U.S., when I first came to the U.S. in 2007, I went to a conference, I think 2008 or 2009, and then everything was automated. It's, it's kind of like, you know, like it's, it's convenient because it's 24-7. Uh, on the other hand, it's kind of like, I want to talk to a person who can, who can stand my questions, you know. Um, I don't have to, you know, like repeat the same, you know, one, two, three, four, like 20 times to understand what's going on. So, um, so, so I think, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the relationship between the two, I mean, of course, you know, like um, um, there, the cost is a major concern, um, you know, in, in this people versus machine. Uh, uh, so, so I think it's, it's a very interesting uh, finding. But the issue is, um, 
I guess, you know, like I, I, I guess I'm, I'm all over the place again. Um, one of the things that um, about immigrants is not that they are not needed, right? Um, for example, in agriculture and everything, they are needed for the economy. But then at the same time, there are lots also um, very strong voice uh, in some cases, um, which is against immigration. So I just wonder how you, how, it, the, how does immigration come into this picture? Thanks. That question was for um, Fernando, uh, if you can, whether you have uh, thought about this or maybe, you know, everybody here after that. No, I haven't thought about it in that form. Mm -hmm. So it gives me a, a new perspective. Right. So, um, yeah. So, you know, for example, like I, you know, I, I think I know a little bit about uh, Chinese immigrants. Um, so when, 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 when Chinese laborers came to the U.S. to construct uh, the uh, cross-country uh, railroad, they were hailed as the model workers for some time. And once the construction was over, uh, they were portrayed as opium users, um, you know, like um, they are uh, breaking the union. Uh, they're getting, you know, robbing jobs uh, from, from hardworking, um, working class families in the US. Uh, you know, who had to, you know, force their daughters to be prostitutes and things like that. You know, it's, it's, it's like they are low moral. They, they, these workers, Chinese workers, um, don't have moral morality and things like that. And, and their low price is just for competing people out of their business, out of their property, out of their um, family, even. Um, so I think that's 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 what it is. You know, it's it's not like. The, they are not needed. They are they are needed, and then there, there are certain times they are not needed, and um, it's not only about uh, the cost uh, and whether they are hardworking or not, and, and things like that. And I think you know, in today's today's world, um, I don't know how how true that that still that still is the case, um, and um, and and so I, yeah. Excuse me. I was going to say um, I when you were talking about that, it reminded me of what happened in Arizona. Um, I lived in Arizona from 2004 to um, 2006 and then moved to Nevada. But when I was living in Arizona, and this is you know just anecdotal observation, I don't know any research on this, but when I was living in Arizona, there were a few like crazy people down on the border who were like, oh, don't let them come in and talking about, you know, the kind of rhetoric that we had later about building walls and all of that kind of stuff. But they were generally in Phoenix anyway, regarded as like those crazy outliers down at the border. And then the 2008 crash happened and, you know, before that, there was just all kinds of construction work in Phoenix, like houses were going up everywhere and there was always work for anybody who was coming up. And a lot of the laborers that worked in the construction work, building houses, building buildings, so forth. If you've ever been to Phoenix, it's just one sprawling suburb is basically like six million people just spread out. And they were building all of these houses and they had all of these laborers coming up from Mexico. And uh, it was perfectly cool because, you know, it's hot, terrible work to do construction in the middle of a desert. And these were the people who were willing to do it and nobody talked, um, you know, it wasn't generally regarded as a, uh, a problem except for a few, you know, crazy prejudiced people. Then the crash happened, right? And immediately after that, the politics in Arizona totally changed. They were, you know, there were uh, accent laws. You can't teach English with an accent, which was 
probably the stupidest law that they did. And it certainly got thrown out of court eventually. But my husband used to make jokes about how to, you know, an Arizona accent sounds like John Wayne, like that you got to teach English sounding like John Wayne. I mean, what does that even mean? You can't teach English with an accent. And, but there were other more serious laws that started, um, uh, you know, putting people in, you know, the, the local police started enforcing uh, immigration um, actions. And you had Sheriff Joe putting people in tents in the middle of the desert and, you know, people that I never heard prejudicial attitudes from before were suddenly talking about, oh, they're taking all our jobs and they're coming up here. And, you know, the politics turned ugly, everything. And all of this, in my estimation anyway, really started being a popular discourse after the crash. Like there wasn't a need for having workers build houses anymore because houses were not being built anymore. So now they're just quote unquote dirty Mexicans, where before they were hardworking people who were, you know, coming to help us out. So I think that that economic aspect of prejudice and prejudicial language anyway, I mean, it's a $64,000 question as to whether those prejudices existed before the economic reality and just emerged because of it, or if they um, uh, were developed in response to the economic reality. But I think that that's especially in light of the topic of this um, uh, of this session is an interesting aspect of how class and race interact with each other because you hear popularized racial uh, tensions in hard economic times more than you hear it in in boom times and times when things are going well. And of course, we're in a position now and that things have been, not been going well for some time now, you know, and that, that working class people have been having it tough no matter what for decades now. So I think that we're seeing that kind of rhetoric emerge because of the capitalistic ideas of competition and this feeling that you gotta, you know, you gotta take advantage of whatever you gotta take advantage of and racial language and racial prejudices are a way of distinguishing yourself within that within that rhetoric you know hire me because i'm white versus uh hire me because i'm skilled yeah. so i think you you know, yeah. i yeah. think it relates yeah. very much to the chinese experience of a um, hundred years ago or more mm -hmm. thank you yeah. um but this discussion i think is quite important um because it's important to take a look at how racism and racialization uh, is very much uh, intertwined into the dynamics of capitalism and global capitalism. And that is not so much uh, <clears throat> um, put forth. So there's like stereotypes and uh, uh, stereotypes or whatever, or prejudice. But how do these uh, things, uh, manifestations of racializ uh, racialization of society, really is very much integ integral to capitalism, uh, the logic of capitalism, such as the constant search for cheap labor, uh, both within the nation state and on the global scale, beyond the nation state, beyond borders. So if you take a look at building borders, like, oh, we don't want the Mexicans to come here, there is uh, the breaking down of borders when it comes to seeking uh, uh, and the social construction of, of cheap labor for profit. So uh, especially in the, uh, uh, in the dynamics, if you take a look at uh, race, uh, racialization of American society, it is very much there. Uh, and the constitution saying that we want to promote the free enterprise, it's already built in. 
slavery in, uh, actually became uh, very much promotive of capitalism. Uh, and, and so that's why we don't want to uh, eliminate that. There are new forms of slavery within capitalism. And so these are things that we need to research. But I am interested in uh, Fernando's uh, uh, um, discussion on uh, technology. If we take a look at the, the pandemic, um, and I think what uh, he was saying, I have not re uh, listened to, the, uh, to his uh, tape. Uh, I didn't have time. Uh, there are cases where within the technology uh, sector, there's also hierarchization. And uh, there are <clears throat> workers within the capitalist system who are somewhere there and highly paid, and, but also uh, low paid uh, within the technological structure and uh, making minute uh, uh, divisions of labor so that you can pay uh, them. And all, all of these in many ways uh, uh, was affected by the pandemic, uh, which is the pandemic. And it's also partly, if we uh, the way we handled it, it's also related to the crisis of uh, uh, capitalism. That, that's inherent in capitalism. It's not because there was the virus, but the way we responded to it uh, somehow is also was also affected. And now it, it continuing to respond, it's also affected by the logic of capitalism. So even pandemics, right? Uh, people lost jobs. And of course the, the people in the informal economy, they were also, they're not in technology, but they were also very much affected. Uh, so, so this is very complex and how do we analyze these so that we can make them simpler for people who, who are not in the academics because I find the academics uh, not so much involved in social change, but how do we package our research so that we can uh, influence and share knowledge, the knowledge we produce and the sources of knowledge are the workers. And yet we create, we reproduce uh, <clears throat> outcomes of research that's not really being disseminated and empowering them. Well, <clears throat> I think to take a step back a little bit, the, uh, sometimes you say something obvious that people knew all the time but at the same time, we don't always know we know it. So in particular, um, how processes unfold, I'm gonna get real uh, abstract here for a minute. How processes unfold, there's a tendency to either to the extreme, imagine conspiracy or plan or to the other extreme, imagine accident. And most of us who probably have a more progressive or left or, you know, Marxist or Marxian or whatever perspective, we see the patterns that emerge and we spend a great deal of time um, battling against or struggling with um, the kind of mainstream people who insist things just happen. But of course, the ideology that underlies things just happen is that everybody is a free agent and there's no coercion in the world. Um, things don't just happen, but they're also not plotted and planned. However, I find myself and a number of other people, say critical thinkers and people on the left, who sometimes move a little bit too far in the other direction and begin to attribute um, intentionality to uh, cohesion, if you will. In other words, why are there so many Serbs and Macedonians in the town of Crown Point, Indiana? Well, it wasn't simply because 
the king of Serbia and the princes of Macedonia decided to send people here. But it also wasn't just accident. It was accident that the steel mills were hiring at the time that there were economic and social upheavals in Central and Eastern Europe <coughs> during the uh, 1910s and 1920s. So there was some intentionality because in point of fact, uh, the, uh, the companies recruited. In fact, I heard one story where they uh, went to a town in Mexico and just put up signs that said jobs in Gary, Indiana. And people got on board a train to go to Gary, Indiana, wherever that was, to get a job. And the borders were, you know, relatively open then. So there's some intentionality, but a lot of it also is just um, once something happens, other things stick to it. It's not the same as um, plotting and planning, but it's also not the same as accident. And we know this. I'm not telling you anything that we don't already know. Trial and error is another way of saying it. Um, throw it against the wall and see what sticks. There's a million expressions we have in our language. And I really do wish, this is also the logic behind statistics, by the way. It's basically the same thing. Statistics are not just numbers. They're a, a, a mode of methodology where you look at things probabilistically and see what sticks with what. And then you try to find out which causes which, or whether there's a third thing that's causing both and you know all the other ways we try to analyze things. Um, so I think for myself, I just uh, have to wake up in the morning and remind myself that um, the working class and the capitalist class doesn't sit down at the breakfast table every morning and say, uh, how can I plan my day according to Alan's social theory? Uh, that's, yeah, but yet I find myself sometimes getting into that mode. They don't. The capitalists themselves have their planning, they have their club of growth, or they have their um, rent corporation, and they have their Better Business Bureau, and they have uh, other associations bigger and more powerful than that, Council on Foreign Relations, etc. They have those things. But in the end, accident, just like with evolution, mutation, is the genesis of all this. And then certain things survive and certain things grow and thrive and certain things dissipate. And I think uh, that's the way it is with a lot of this. And I was just trying to bring it back to the question of technology and labor. There are patterns, but I also think that on the individual level, each capitalist, each enterprise is mainly preoccupied with protecting their own enterprise. So they'll go back and forth. If you look at clothing, for example, it's really interesting to me. If you look at clothing, you might see um, very similar things in the same store over the course of a year. And one of them says made in Guatemala. And one of them says made in Thailand. And one of them says made in Bangladesh. And one of them says made in Ethiopia. And then another one says made in Mexico. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with, they just follow the money not because of a plot, but because they have no choice. If they don't seek out uh, cheaper labor wherever they can, they'll uh, <coughs> provide a business to those who are better at doing it. The uh, human species, we do not have to kill each other to survive. That's a capitalist myth to justify the fact that corporations have to kill each other in order to survive in a broader sense uh, because Capitalism is unsustainable, and so at a certain point, it begins to contract, and then they fight over uh, shrinking pie. Again, that's, we know that that's not true for humanity outside of politics, but it is true for a monopoly game, if you're all familiar with that. There's no way you're going to have more players five hours into the game than you started with. It can't happen. So I think that's how they handle technology, that there are general patterns, the general process, which even Marx talked about mechanization, automation is a general process worldwide. But on the other hand, at any given historical moment, if they can make something cheaper with the quasi-slave labor, they don't really have 
<coughs> except for pockets here and there, don't really have full on old fashioned slavery because they're not housing and feeding the, the exploited workforce. They're basically uh, semi enslaving them to debt, but they're not, it's not like they're providing, um, you know, dungeons or like in ancient Rome or slave quarters like in the USA for people. Um, and that keeps it flexible for them. But Detroit is a good case in point. Whereas in Detroit, they, uh, the factories began to close because factories were opening up in, in Japan in particular and somewhat in Germany, auto factories. Um, <laughs> but that wasn't just cheap labor. It was also that the Japanese factories and steel mills, the auto plants were more modern. They were built after the war. So they were built in the 1950s and 60s. And the ones in the US were built in the 1890s and 1920s. They were not as efficient. So it was a combination of cheap labor and mechanization. The response was to lower the cost of labor in the US. There was the two tiered labor, labor wage system. So that in a lot of the factories, one of the first things they did was um, they, um, what should we call it? They fragmented the labor force more. For example, the janitors, custodians in the factories who used to be in the auto workers union or the steel workers union were now uh, all fired and then replaced with either temp labor, temporary labor, or uh, they had their own union but they were no longer paid an equivalent pay scale. And the union leaders in most cases have rolled over with all this. So it's now the situation where in some of the factories, um, the workers will be making 28 to $30 an hour, which is comfortable depending on what part of the country you live in. It's not really affluent, but it's certainly survivable. Um, but the deal was that new hires would come in at 14 to $15 an hour. Now, 14 to $15 an hour is not sustainable. It's, uh, it's almost humorous that just a few years ago, people were calling $15 an hour a living wage, when in fact it isn't, unless, uh, unless you have three people in a family working or something. Um, and so, Parts of the auto industry have come back again to Detroit with a combination of cheap labor and they also tore down some of the old factories. The point I'm getting at is they oscillate. They zig and they zag. <clears throat> now in the course of the zigging and zagging, there are patterns, there are processes, but it's not necessarily that uh, um, some person high up is saying, okay, time to do this. That happened somewhat, by the way. That also happens regionally with an uh, ironic twist that the uh, Republicans who um, historically supported immigrants more than the Democrats did going back 80 or 100 years ago because they owned big factories and they were the wealthy and they wanted the cheap labor. And the Democrats tended to be concerned about the they weren't actually concerned about the problem. They were concerned about getting votes by pandering to the problem. Because we also have to keep in mind that these, that they don't believe in any of their stuff. I mean, I would bet my entire house and my entire pension on the reality that uh, Trump has paid for at least two abortions, maybe 10. They don't believe any of this stuff. You know, Trump had undocumented workers working in his businesses while he was screaming and he and they knew it while he was screaming about undocumented workers coming over so they're not driven by ideology but they're but they use it with respect to the foot soldiers again trump is a good example and that he's anti-russia and then pro-russia every other day um depending on what will what will play to his base i think he would have become a liberal democrat if he thought he could be president that way um I don't mean to pick on him. I'm just using it as an example. That sometimes the capitalists are more flexible than we are in, in figuring out what they want to do and how they want to respond to events. Um, 
so I think that has a lot to do with it. I think there are broader patterns, the broader pattern still, the logic of it is to move towards more mechanization and the end, but that within that are various bumps and zigzags, uh, hiccups, whatever term we want to use, where at a given place in a given time, it's actually cheaper and easier. Uh, in Nazi Germany, people have to remember that the, the death camps were labor, were labor camps. They basically worked people to death. They actually had scientists who figured out if you gave someone 700 calories a day, how many days of work could you get out of them before they died? Before they could no longer work and then, you, then they were killed. So I think that explains the ambivalence of the, uh, certainly of the ruling class, the capitalist class in America towards the question of immigration. Uh, those businesses that benefit from it sort of turn a blind eye. Although actually in the ideal case, in the ideal case, you, you keep something illegal, but you let it happen. Because if you make it illegal, you don't get to use it. If you let it happen, you can't control it. So you keep it illegal, but you let it happen. That's what likely would happen if, if uh, a lot of gun control laws were instituted, which I mean, I don't like all these people running around with guns. But as a side point, if they instituted strict gun control laws, we know that it would be enforced unevenly. I mean, even something as benign as seatbelt laws are enforced unevenly, depending on the uh, the racing class of the, of the driver of the car. So I'm just throwing that out as a, as a kind of a being in a, a, an airplane looking down on how these processes unfold. And, uh, but I do believe the underlying process is, is, is the drive for cheaper labor because capitalism does have a falling rate of profit. It has to, by definition, it's not, not a, nothing Karl Marx dreamed up. He got this from capitalist economists themselves, themselves. The rate of profit drops, and the more the rate of profit drops, the more desperate the system is. Um, I think a lot of people really confuse micro and macro. It doesn't matter if the richest 1% are getting richer. That doesn't mean the system is not in crisis. There were people who probably had the best meal of their lives on the Titanic before it went down. But I suppose one could turn to another and say this food is really excellent, but uh, you know, then what? So the, the fact that there is a, a systemic crisis and it varies in some places, um, wars are actually started to kill off young people. I have a, a scholar friend from Ethiopia who told me that the war between Ethiopia and Eritrea, what that did was it was a pressure valve basically to kill off tens and tens of thousands of young men to ease the unemployment crisis. And that, that, that war ended in more or less a stalemate. Um, so I think, that, I think that basically the overall pattern is a drive for cheap labor or rather cheaper production costs. And nothing is cheaper than uh, a machine, right? Uh, I'll take the last extreme example of that, which is um, one of the very most profitable industries now in the world is gambling. Very, very profitable. You put a machine, a slot, especially the slot machines, you spend some money building this machine and then you don't have to pay it health insurance. You have to pay it a wage. You don't have to pay it anything. And people go in there and they put in a dollar and they get 90 cents back. So because they're getting 90 cents back, they don't feel like a, they're a complete loser. They get a, a, a jolt of happiness every time they win once in a while, because if they lost all the time, they'd stop playing. And these things make massive amounts of money with very little labor. If you look, if you look at the number of people that are being served on the floor of a casino, there might be 150. And you look at the number of people that are taking care of them, and it's a few people going around giving free drinks and then probably some people in a booth looking out for cheaters. That's about it. So it's that's mechanization to the extreme. That's just like banking is another example of that. Insurance is another example. 
These are all ways of um, extracting profit with the least costly labor as possible. And, uh, but they can't, there are also time lag issues though. See, that's where it gets even more complicated because they'll promote a policy and then things will change and the old policy is now not the one that they need for the moment. You know, an example of that again was immigration where they encouraged massive immigration into the 1920s. Um, but by 1920 or so in the United States, you now had uh, soldiers coming home from the war and you did have massive uh, industrialization, which provided a lot of jobs, but you also had a huge influx of white and black workers coming from the South to the North. And you had this continuous influx of workers from your Eastern and Southern Europe, especially. So that in 1924, they had to start passing these anti-immigration laws where just, you know, 10 years earlier, they were hanging up signs in Croatia saying, come to the U.S. for a job. So, uh, you know, but I guess if I had to say what I think the long-term process is, I think it's the, the drive to sustain profit. Otherwise, you go out of business. And to sustain profit when the pie is shrinking, um means you have to find cheaper labor you know they, they do other things too i right? planned obsolescence advertising and especially debt that is a, a major way that they sustain the system but if anybody needed any proof that the system is in crisis just look at the debt um and the people who poo poo it and say it's not important what they're really saying is it's not important for the, during my lifetime but the fact that the entire national debt was $900 billion in uh, 1980. And now is what, 100 times that much, something like that? I don't know, 900 billion would be, um, I, don't know, I guess 20 times that much, even so to multiply 20 fold over. Um, so that's not sustainable. So they're also always looking for cheaper labor. And if you look at how Amazon treats its workers, it's just astounding, um, beyond astounding. And these factories, I'm sure you're all familiar with what these sweatshop factories are in other countries, do not like what we imagine it. If somebody puts up a tent that's uh, 100 feet long and 30 feet wide, and they have uh, a dangerous wire running electricity under the tent and they have 30 sewing machines and usually young women sitting at them working all day long. Not much capital investment. And if, if they need to, they could shut that thing down and open up another one in Bangladesh. And then five months later, open up one in Guatemala, you know, um, or so anyway, I don't know if that was helpful or not, but that's kind of, you know, trying to, get away from saying, well, the policymakers planned this long in advance, but also getting away with saying, well, it's just the free will of people in a pluralistic society, uh, you know, bouncing around and things sort of happen that way. I don't know. I put uh, a link in the chat uh, from an article that I read a few years ago that I come back to a lot because I think one of the things and I think you're exactly right, Alan. It's not um, some evil cartel somewhere planning all of this and plotting it all. And it also isn't just happening. And I think that the systemic thing that that reproduces a lot of what you're talking about is borders. It goes back to some of what Lagaya was talking about and about immigration that Fernando was talking about. And that is that labor, unlike capitalists, can't move from one country to the other easily. And, uh, and borders are a way of reinforcing the kinds of divisions that you were talking about locally as well. And this article came out in The Economist, the one I put in the chat, in which they showed that economically, 
and this is on a macro level, obviously, borders are costing wealth, that it, it, it isn't, you know, um, that it's anti-wealth generating. Now, of course, The Economist is talking about it. Yeah, the article is talking about it from an economist's point of view. But what I took from that was that this is the way theft works, that this is wealth that could be in the hands of the workers if the workers were allowed to move freely, like what you were describing was happening in the 1910s and 20s, where they could hear about jobs in another location in the world and go to those jobs easily, then you would have um, them acquiring wealth, them improving their life circumstances. But instead, because the borders are there, here's, I think the figure was 78 billion, no trillion dollars that is just being lost. And most of that is going um, to profit to a few people because labor doesn't have a position in this. They don't have a form of negotiation. They're being pitted once again, you know, against each other. So if I, you know, if you want to make a decent living in this location, I just pack up and go to another location. And that's the incentive in the system. Whereas if we did away with these border restrictions and labor could move freely, then that wealth would be generated to the laborers and not just to the capitalists. And of course, you know, it, it's always going to be a game of um, now that that move's been made, they're going to make a counter move and so forth. So I'm not suggesting that this necessarily would cure everything, but I think it's um, an important place to do research and intervention and activism is to ask the question, why do we, you know, why are we, is it really security that we're talking about or is it uh, dividing laborers that we're talking about? And I think most of the time when countries set up rigid borders, it doesn't have anything to do with security. It has to do with um, preventing those labor forces from moving at will to where the work is, where the resources are. Let me, let me toss in a note of uh, pessimism or cynicism in that. I think there are two things that prevent that. The first is obviously um, when the larger um, structures, say the imperialist structures, empires uh, fragment, lots of people come in to try to grab a piece of it. Victor Orban doesn't want Hungary to take over Romania, but he wants to own as much as he can in Hungary. So you begin to have uh, metaphorical fiefdoms, if you will, uh, where people grab what they can. It's, it's interesting. I have a friend who studies gangs who knows, she knows them from the inside, inside and out. And she said to me 10 or 15 years ago that there's a process happening in Chicago that the the 1980s stereotype of the Crips and the Bloods or the, the gangsters and the disciples uh, where they each had like, you know, 10,000 members in the gang. She said, that's not what's happening now. What's happening now is that any eight kids that control a two block area, that's the gang. And there isn't particularly a head to it. And we see that happening worldwide. It's not just the US competing with, uh, what you might call it, with, with Russia or China, we see countries like the Philippines um, playing both sides. One minute threatening to go to China if the US does this, and the other minute really concerned about China because of the battle over uh, territory in the South China Seas. We see a lot of the allies of the US uh, willing to break away and uh, you know sort of declare independence from that. So this fragmentation, which comes back to the Aesop fable of who will build a cat, which needs to be read to the people who put out the Economist and Foreign Policy and all these other journals. Uh, the, the fable of who will build a cat is when all the mice get together and realize someone needs to put a bell on the cat. And then the question is, who will do it? 
So all the capitalists agree that you guys need to do something about this. And they say, that's absolutely 100% right. You guys need to do something about this. So that's the first problem. That's how the borders spring up. Basically, it's people uh, grabbing territory. They don't fully believe in these borders, by the way. You know, Russia certainly doesn't believe in the border. Uh, Saddam Hussein didn't believe in the border with Kuwait. The US hasn't believed in borders at all, ever, since probably the 1890s. Um, you know, so that's just uh, raw meat for the masses, so to speak. Um, but there's a second point too, even if somehow or some way um, that was achieved, that uh, labor could move freely, which it, that's not gonna happen. But if it did happen, the system would collapse. It wouldn't be sustainable, period, because capitalism has this endemic problem of the, I call it the crisis of misproduction, or, but it's called the crisis of overproduction. We don't have too much of everything, but we have too many of some things. And whenever people say, well, you know, a planned economy doesn't work. You have bureaucrats a thousand miles away making decisions. How can they know what kind of shoes people in Tucson need when they're living in Washington and therefore a planned economy doesn't work? My reply is granted, that's, that's a real issue. Now, does an unplanned economy work better? And in fact, there's no such thing as an unplanned economy because an unplanned economy simply means the biggest bully plans it for their own, for their own purposes. They decide where to build a highway, where to build an airport, whose property to take, which, which farmers to give money to to not grow food. So I think that um, I think that that is absolutely worth fighting for, the dissolving of borders, the right of labor to move freely. I also think it's gonna run up against uh, two brick walls. The smaller brick wall are the, is the kingdom building by the, uh, all the locals. And again, it's interesting because even, um, I mean, there's the rise of so many of these petty dictators now around the world, whether it was talking about Brazil or talking about the Philippines or talking about, well, India, the guy isn't petty, he's pretty big. But it's sort of the same thing still, the hyper-nationalism, the ethno-religious nationalism. But even beyond that, if somehow that was transcended, then the system would collapse. Just as if the uh, wages of every Black worker in the U.S., not even counting uh, Hispanic workers, just if every Black worker in the U.S. had her or his wages raised to be equal, to the wages of the capitalism would collapse. It, it could not sustain itself. No one would make a profit, you know, by the way, capitalism is run today. So I think, you know, we have a responsibility to operate with two hands at the same time. You know, we have to uh, keep our eye on the ball as, as people who, who do have a, a deeper, broader analysis about what, how the pattern is unfolding but we also have to immerse ourselves in the daily lives of people who you know, are struggling to survive because it's only in the process of those struggles that the lessons that we think we are so smart about uh, can be illuminated, exposed, and understood. Otherwise, you, you end up you know, with the ideas that sound good, but they don't ring true. You know, I had a student once say to me, you need to talk to my cousin because you explain things well. And I said, no. He said, why not? I said, your cousin doesn't know me. It doesn't matter if it sounds good. All kinds of things sound good. My mom used to say, chew your food a hundred times. And get the vitamins. Why? I don't know. We have 10 fingers. Who knows what the origin of the myth was. It sounds logical, though. You could make anything sound logical if you say it in a certain tone of voice, you know? Doesn't the government sometimes spy on people? Yeah. So therefore, all the COVID measures were part of a government plan to spy it. You see, anything can sound logical. I said, the, the guy doesn't know me. He doesn't, why should he trust? I'd be scared if he didn't trust me just because I explain things a certain way. I said, you learn this and then you go out and you talk to him and he'll trust you. Um, so that's the other hand. 
but on, but then to go back to the first one, if you just do that, you end up immersing yourself in, in reform movements and you end up uh, making excuses. You know, well, Bernie is better than this. And then, well, Biden is better than that. And well, we have to keep Manchin and, um, you know, cinema in office because of this and this. And then pretty soon you, you almost want to choke when they say things like uh, George W. Bush heroically stood up to Trump. It's like, you know, so you can't drown yourself in the liberal reformism, but you do, we do have to find a way to relate to that. Uh, seems to me, I don't know, I'm going on too long, but I just feel um, a lot of times, just like, again, I, I, my mind thinks about dichotomies and the false dichotomy of reformism as an ism versus preaching. And um, actually, Lenin actually had an interesting thing where we talked about trade unions. He said, there's schools for revolution. And I like the, the, the concept, putting Lenin aside and, um, and unions aside, schools is a way of saying, look, the schools don't produce anything, but they make you smarter. And the reform struggles, they can take it away tomorrow. I mean, who would have imagined we'd be fighting over voting rights and abortion? Who could even have conceived of that 10 years ago? Um, they can take anything away but it's hard to take away the change of people's consciousness. And young people are not buying it that much. I said this in the session yesterday, unfortunately they're not buying much of anything, but they're sort of passively, passively really, really rejecting um, this, this drive to the right. And some actually actively, we saw it in the summer of 2020. Um, but I think, I think this is all related actually because uh, this question of uh, automation, uh, when people said 50 years ago that I'm safe, I have a white collar job, these computers are gonna create robots, they're gonna take away the jobs of blue collar people. I, I wasn't a sociologist then, and I'm not sure I'm much of one now after 50 years, um, but I just, said, well, I don't understand. Can't computers replace accountants even more easily than workers on a line? They don't even have to build a machine to screw the vault in place. You know, uh, accountants and insurance estimators and all these things, you know, can be very rapid. And now we're seeing it professors, right? My goodness, what, what percentage of uh, instruction is now done by people that get paid one-fifth of what regular professors make. And that's a combination getting back to, to uh, what Fernando said, it's a combination of mechanization and cheap labor. Um, it's not sustainable. So unless there's a movement, a serious movement that doesn't shoot itself on the feet all the time. Um, but maybe this is the price we're paying. I think the, to put a Marxist, undertone to this uh, with all of its dribs and drabs and ups and downs and experiments because it really was just a grand it's been a grand experiment for 150 years actually you know how how long did it take feudalism to triumph over ancient slavery you know 10,000 years <laughs> how long did it take capitalism to triumph over feudalism 700 years so why in the world imagine that the most profound change of all could somehow happen within the course of two, two or three lifetimes. Um, but with all that, what, what Marxism represented to a lot of people wasn't just, oh, we get to share the food, oh, we all get to have medicine. It really meant that, um, that it was the highest expression of the notion of human progress which capitalism was one useful thing. I won't say it was good, but I'll say it was useful, was uh, you know, developing the notion of human progress. Capitalism was healthy. Now it's, it's, it's uh, taken the opposite tack. But the notion of human progress. So by the time we get to 1950, it was like, with all of its problems, the Soviet Union did defeat the Nazis and lift a lot of people out of poverty. And you look at what happened in China, which 
it's true in the short term, you, you can make uh, gains through bribery. And so China clearly in the short term by bribing a sector of the population with capitalism did improve the standard of living since the late 1970s. But in point of fact, the greatest boost to the Chinese standard of living was between 19, uh, you know, 49 and the middle 70s. There's an interesting study done comparing China and India. And they said that if you looked at the uh, number of years of life lost, even taking into account the huge famines in China, uh, India had lost more because of the uh, infant mortality and all these other things. So with the uh, decline of uh, socialism, the Soviet Union, which had been going on for decades, but probably the apple finally dropped from the tree in the mid fifties, although the apple was already, you know, deteriorating before that, nothing happens better, nothing. But the apple probably dropped the 1950s when Khrushchev said, you know, um, let's be friends with America. And then there were still residuals, especially in Latin America, in Africa, some of these places. Um, and then China, the apple again dropped there probably in the middle 70s. Uh, and this whole notion of not just socialism or communism is possible, but the human progress is possible. The notion that was embraced in different forms by everybody from uh, you know, John Steinbeck to uh, Ponte Corvo, the Italian movie director, to Picasso, to Jean Paul Sartre, to Robert Ryan, the movie star, and a whole bunch of other directors. It was just embraced that, oh, well, you know, we're on an upward move. And, and the shattering of that has put us in a backwater. Like when part of a river pools backwards into a swamp and uh, rots for a while. So, you know, maybe that's a stage we're in, but there's no point in self-pity. We don't have the right to do that. That's self-pity is a middle-class uh, luxury. Uh, working class people don't have the the uh, time or ability to, to, to philosophize about how sad life is. You know, they do, but and they also have to get up and work. Um, but I think that's related to this. You know, when people say, what's the difference between a Marxist view and all the other radical views? And I say, well, understand there are many different definitions of Marxism, at least as many as there are of Christianity. But I think a, a core view is Marxism doesn't think the system is sustainable. That's what separated Marx from all the utopian socialism communists of the day. It was a combination of having a vision of a better world, but also of uh, analyzing the mechanics of capitalism to see how the friction, uh, you know, created the self-destruction. I went on way too long. How do you see the future unfolding with respect to the, the dialectic for cheap labor between uh, automation and uh, immigration? Cheap, yeah, so cheap, I think cheap labor will be the, the solver the, the world and the, the, they're looking for cheap labor so they can maximize their profits, the companies. So wherever this, this is exploitation, that was, um, so right now, a lot of, People complain when the jobs are heading to Mexico, down south. Um, they so they say that they that they're not they're not paying the workers right here in the U.S. So they're heading down um, for that cheap labor. So the U.S. So uh, NAFTA in 1994, people complain about it, about the uh, 
So, Guy, do you have any thoughts about um, how this might unfold in the future? What I'm saying is that the advancement in technology uh, really took place within uh, the context of uh, capitalism, the logic of capitalism. Um, and it has penetrated, it seems, almost all uh, segments of society. We are not talking about AI. And <laughs> I'm afraid this is going to change the way educational system uh, will be operating. And Indiana University, for example, as a whole department and prides itself uh, that uh, we will be in the forefront of uh, AI research and advancement. On the other hand, there are also those who are saying what are the ethical issues of, of AI. So I think it's uh, important at this point that we are trying to see a new uh, social order. How can we uh, assess the current advancement of uh, technology in uh, and its impact on humanity, humanization, uh, ethical issues that we need to to uh, consider um, and who are in control of this uh, technology. And even in warfare, you know, suddenly in the war on uh, uh, Ukraine, suddenly you just hear, oh, these are new weapons that we never heard about. And we spent a lot of money on weapons to destroy uh, rather than, and, take how many how much money do we spend on technology to build and technology to bring people uh, together so uh, a new challenge for scholars and scholar activists and i think fernando is has done a really good uh, yeah. contribution to mm -hmm. this uh, because so uh, this particularly we cannot comprehend this very much. So there's the need to, to have teamwork with other uh, people in disciplines. Let's bring, for example, engineers <laughs> into our fold uh, of research so we, we uh, learn from each other. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm not very much uh, in technology and I don't have the probably the training, but I'm very willing, for example, to take a look at AI, for example, how this is uh, transforming the way we educate, the way we learn, uh, and the way we produce knowledge, and the way we relate. Should this be the way we should be learning? We, we, we uh, talk to technology, we learn from technology, and sometimes the vision is made so cheap so that you'll just depend on it. Like my son, uh, who is an engineer and would pay only $20 for updating his uh, engineering skills. And say, so how much do you pay? I pay only $20 for this particular package of learning. And how do you, uh, how do they evaluate the fluid? Or oh, I just do some, uh, uh, I, I do this and then they look at it. And the, all the all the lectures are already there. The, the the ones the instructor who made the the lectures you do not even meet. You just look at the machine. <laughs> so so no interaction. Uh, and so this is something that uh, uh, we could uh, explore farther as a source of social problems uh, and the way we. Uh, interact. In fact, some arguments I have read in the literature is if you are doing automation, it is also because partly that we could easily control labor, we could easily divide labor because they're not anymore coming into places. Uh, that's very easy to, to do in education. You don't need the teachers to come together and you can control them as well. And capitalism has uh, also penetrated uh, education, I say way, way back, the kinds of theories 
and ideas that we teach, we just accept. Uh, and uh, business schools, uh, we teach them how to be capitalists. We never, there's no, no course at all uh, where we say, okay, now let's have cooperatives, train entrepreneurs, uh, train people uh, to, to set up cooperatives. No, it has to be petty capitalism or being uh, uh, a corporate manager of transnational corporations. So it is, it is I, I see this as a crisis, the crisis of capitalism that's also affecting our minds and the way we produce uh, knowledge and the way we educate. Let me, uh, I, I guess we sort of have to close out. Um, I'm gonna close out being roundabout like I often am. Uh, before I get to the point. So um, when I was in college, there was this a sort of cynical movie called The Servant, which none of you know, because it was we're talking about the 1960s. So The Servant uh, was a story about a, uh, a very rich man. It was a movie, Dirk Bogart, I forget who was in it. Anyway, a really, really rich guy who had the servant and uh, the, he bossed the servant around constantly. He had the servant do this, he had the servant do that. And by the end of the movie, the servant was doing everything. And that's sort of a, a take on, uh, Hegel had a metaphor also of the master and the servant. Whereas if you have the servant brush your teeth for you and comb your hair for you and put your shoes on and carry you around from place to place and feed you, at a certain point, the question is who's really in, has power in the situation? <laughs> and I think the same thing is true with respect to uh, technology. Uh, there are so many doomsayers who say that all these machines will eliminate the working class. And I don't mean to minimize what will be decades of pain for people. I, I, there's no question hopefully not centuries of pain, but certainly decades of pain for people all over the world who, who die unnecessarily of everything from uh, cancer to auto crashes to war, to hunger, COVID. Um, but in the long run, we have to understand that if, if they eliminated the whole working class and only had one big machine doing everything, it only takes one person to pull the plug out on the wall and the whole machine breaks down. Complex structures on the one hand provide a massive amount of power to whoever controls it. But on the other hand, complex structures are very vulnerable. As we see now with the supply chain crisis, for example, um, going on worldwide. So, um, you know, when the doomsayers talk about how uh, the working class ultimately uh, is gonna be obsoleted because the capitalists will have all power. Remember, the more concentrated power is, well, uh, to quote a 50-year-old uh, dead Chinese philosopher, um, capitalism is a paper tiger and an iron tiger. Don't underestimate that it's an iron tiger, the tremendous damage and destruction and death it can cause, but understand that at its core, it's, it's weak and uh, they couldn't do anything. They couldn't tie their shoes if there wasn't a worker in Oman who, who allowed oil to flow to a ship that took it to a factory that refined it in the US that turned it into plastic that ended up creating the tip of the shoelace that the capitalist needs to tie his shoes. And we have to keep that in mind because I think as, uh, as critics, we sometimes, you know, only see the negative of the dialectic. That is, this will be transcended by that. And we don't see that actually um, the great majority of species that ever existed on Earth died. But those that remained were more complex. And I think we have to have that same optimistic view in the long run, but realistic view <laughs> in the short run about what we face. So... Anyway, you know, we could do this all day, but I think people have other responsibilities. So uh, wrap up comments, anybody? Patty, you want 
Oh, well, Plisithia, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, um, I think it's a very interesting conversation. I, I was thinking about automation and, uh, um, you know, how powerful it is at the same time. I mean, you know, like it's, you know, like, like, like you said, it can be unplugged and uh, controlled. Um, so, you know, it can control people when it's running, but, you know, you just need to empower, you know, unplug it. Um, uh, and also in terms of, I, I think about an example of, um, I can't remember, it's, um, I think it's uh, um, Facebook or something, um, you know, there's the taxation issue in other countries and things like that. Um, I think technology sometimes can be used um, to serve the purpose of people, for example, like, you know, for, for maybe it, the physical border is difficult to uh, cross. But the virtual border probably it's easier, you know, if, if like millions of workers, um, you know, uh, work together and, and build a kind of like working system online and things like that, uh, that, that, that kind of, you know, facilitates uh, the flow of workers across, you know, borders, physical borders. So yeah, that's, that's yeah, that's, that's just a thought. It's, it's a wonderful uh, session. Thank you. Well, I guess we're gonna uh, call it a wrap and um, thanks everybody for coming. And I thought it was a really good discussion too. A lot of insights here and I um, thank you Fernando for <clears throat> sparking a lot of thinking about automation and immigration. And uh, so uh, next session is in 40 minutes. I hope some of you will join there and uh, I will shut things down and stop the recording now. So don't well, forget, don't forget we can continue talking online on the web page. So if you have some other ideas or want to throw some things out there, please do so. Yeah, thanks Cynthia and Patty, Legaya and, and Fernando for providing a framework. Otherwise we would be talking about philosophy. <laughs> Well, the difference between philosophy and sociology is that we have data and uh, and what you, you did was help provide us with a framework for the so discussion would be grounded. Um, so thank you for that and thank you for all. Thanks. Goodbye. <laughs>